11. How to eat more calories without eating real food. A criticism that one hears frequently of refined sugar is that it supplies empty calories. This is true. Often the critics go on to say that the refining process is at fault in that it removes essential nutrients that are present in unrefined sugar in significant amounts. This is largely not true, as we have seen. Having considered what happens when you take sugar in addition to your other foods, let us now look at what happens when you take it instead of some of your other foods. After all, if people take 500 calories a day as sugar, and sometimes much more, it is likely that there will be some reduction in other foods. There must be a limit to how much even the most gluttonous person can eat. In the simplest situation, imagine a diet of 2,500 calories a day, made up largely of good nutritious foods like meat and cheese and milk and fish and fruit and vegetables, with some potatoes and bread and breakfast cereal. Now keep the calories at 2,500, but replace 500 or 550 of them by sugar, the average amount taken in a day. I have shown that you can usually do this simply by adding only moderate amounts of white sugar to your tea and coffee and taking an occasional sugar-sweetened soft drink. Clearly, the result of this replacement of 20% of your calories by sugar would be a reduction in your intake of nutrients, protein, all vitamins, all mineral elements, also by 20%. No nutritional deficiency will occur if your previous diet contained an excess of 20% of all the nutrients you required. But suppose it did not contain this surplus. More important, suppose that you were one of those who takes more than the average amount of sugar, equal perhaps to 30% of your calories, or even 40%. Now it begins to be more difficult, as you can see, to imagine that the diet of 2,500 calories which originally supplied as much of the nutrients as you needed will still do when the foods containing them are replaced by 30% or 40% of nutrient-free food. This does not mean that by eating 4.5 or 5 ounces of sugar a day, or even 7 or 8 ounces, you would be rapidly heading for pellagra, beriberi, or scurvy, in extreme cases, with quite a lot of sugar and with the remainder of the diet not too well constructed, such diseases do occasionally occur. I shall later refer to the role of sugar in producing full-fledged protein deficiency in poor countries. But it may very well occur that your diet is marginally insufficient in nutritional terms so that you are in that twilight zone between excellent health and a manifest deficiency disease. Not quite well, tired and easily exhausted, prone to aches and pains and odd infections. All these vague but very real symptoms occur in all of us at some time or another. But while being a bit under par is no proof that your diet is deficient, this must be considered as a possible cause in people whose diets are unbalanced by a large intake of sugar. Is there any way of showing that sugar can really, not just hypothetically, push more desirable foods out of the diet? One way of finding this out, I thought, was to check the trends of consumption of different sorts of food, especially those that are universally recognized as highly nutritious – meat, milk, fish, fruit and eggs. In particular, I decided to look at the trends for meat – for two reasons. First, it falls into the category of highly nutritious foods, and second, for most people, it is also highly palatable. I argued that the increase in the consumption of sugar-containing foods, because they too are very palatable, might be accompanied by a reduction in the consumption of meat. I must break off to explain why, when you look at the relevant statistics, you have to bear in mind two important considerations. The first is that, 
Although total sugar consumption in America stopped rising some 30 or 40 years ago, and in Britain in the last 12 to 15 years, there was a simultaneous decline in the use of sugar in the home and an increase in the amount of sugar used in manufactured food. Crudely, and not completely accurately, one can say that people are putting less sugar in beverages at home, but take more sugar in ice cream and cakes and biscuits, where, incidentally, it comes with plenty of other calories, but not much in the way of nutrients. You would then expect the effects of sugar in pushing other foods out of the diet to be increasing, even though the absolute amount of the sugar itself is not increasing. The second point to bear in mind is that the foods I mentioned, besides being among the nutritionists' favourites, are also relatively expensive, so that more of them tended to be consumed by wealthy people than by poorer people. This social gradient has declined in the Western world with increasing affluence. The poorer sections of the population are not as poor as they used to be. So what nutritionists and economists have been predicting is that general increasing affluence would bring about an increasing consumption of meat, milk, fish, eggs and fruit. One would expect little or no change in consumption by the wealthier groups of the population, who presumably were always able to eat as much of these desirable foods as they wished. On the other hand, one would expect a great rise in the amounts that poorer groups consume as their economic situation improves. So what about my hunch that sugar and sugar-rich foods are driving these better foods out of our diets? We have been able to show that, in the USA, the gradual improvement in living standards has been accompanied by an increase in the consumption of fruit by the poorest section of the population, but at the same time by a significant decrease in the wealthiest section. In the UK, what we did was to look at the change in consumption of the nutritionally more desirable foods between 1936 and 1983 for both the poorest tenth of the British population and the wealthiest tenth. The undoubted improvement in the standard of living during the half-century was reflected in a significantly improved diet among the poorest section of the population. In the 1980s, they were taking more than three times as much milk, twice as many eggs, nearly twice as much fish, and 50% more meat. But for the wealthier tenth of the population, the figures that we were able to collect for 1936 and 1983 showed a significant reduction in all of these items. The consumption of milk, meat, and eggs had fallen by about 30% and of fish by more than 50%. As for meat, everyone with any experience of the country before the Second World War knows that the poorer people ate little meat. See, for example, the famous studies of John Boyd Orr. Yet in spite of a sizable increase among the poorer people, average meat consumption in the UK has hardly changed since before the war. This can only have been due to a decrease in consumption by the wealthier people. More recent evidence comes from the USA, where, as you probably know, there has been a considerable outcry by experts in the last few years about the existence of nutritional deficiencies. How much of a deficiency exists is uncertain. What is certain is that it is much more than most people had thought. It is unlikely that the fall in the nutritional quality of the average American diet was due to increased economic hardship. The more likely explanation is again that some of the nutritionally good foods were being crowded out by the nutritionally inferior sugar-based foods. This is also the belief of Dr. Joan Cortlis, a member of the U.S. Department of Agriculture, who says, The surveys themselves show that it the worsening of diets, lies in the choice being made. Increased consumption of soft drinks and decreased consumption of milk. Increased consumption of snacks and decreased consumption of vegetables and fruit. And snacks contain large amounts of sugar.